ค่ะค่ะแอปเปิลปุ้ยกลายเป็นอะไรกันที่ใช่ดรสตีเวนใช่ I'm here I'm here Can you hear me loud and clear? Okay. Better, yeah. Better, huh? okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. So today is our third week of uh, ID month. Please welcome. And uh, today we are glad to have uh, Dato Christopher again as a chairperson, and also uh, Dr. Stephen. To, to this uh, week, uh, topic is about uh, management of CRD. So with So the lecture will be around 30 minutes. After that, question is. So without further ado, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Christopher to chair this session. Thank you. Thank you, Jeevan. Thank you very much. Uh, first, let me thank everyone uh, for joining us this evening. This is, uh, as Jeevan mentioned, this is the third of the ID series for the month of uh, January. All right. So uh, it's my honor to be able to hear to chair this webinar. Uh, I'm particularly proud because uh, the person who will be speaking afterwards is somebody uh, very close to all of us. Uh, I know I used to bully him when he was in Sungai Bolo, but I can't bully him anymore because now he's kind of a bit short now. All right. Uh, I'm happy to introduce uh, Dr. Stephen Lim. Uh, he is actually an alumni of uh, International Medical University. She graduated with his MRCP in 2012. And most of his training years was that in Penang, all right? So he's basically a Penang boy by birth, if I'm not mistaken. He spent most of his time uh, training in Penang, after which uh, he joined the ID program, and that's where our paths met. Uh, he completed his uh, ID fellowship in 2018, and in his training, he did his training in, of course, Hospital Sungai Belong, but also did uh, a stint as a registrar in the Alfred Hospital, which is a major... Uh, uh, trauma center uh, in Melbourne, Australia. So he's been back for a couple of years now, and now he's been posted to Hospital Raja Prampan Bainon in Ipoh. So from Penang, he's come down to Ipoh. Uh, now he has a lot of interest, and even during his training days, he did a lot of work on antimicrobial stewardship, and especially gram-negative bacterial resistance. So put together, this is the right topic for, for Stephen to talk about. And he's talking about uh, carbapenemum resistant enterobacteria, and I know this is a major problem for many hospitals in our country. Uh, I'm excited to hear, as an update from Stephen, what are the new things we can try to do to address this problem. Uh, so, without further ado, I'm going to ask uh, Stephen to come to the mic and uh, take on his session. So he will talk about uh, CRE and uptake. Stephen, you have the floor. Thank you, Dr. Chris. Uh always a pleasure to meet you, although it's not in person. Um, hey, don't bluff, don't bluff. He's, he's, <laughs> lying. he's not telling the truth here. Okay, all right. Right. Uh, so uh, today my topic will be on CRE. Um, I was particularly given two questions, uh, when to treat and how to treat, particularly on the available uh, drugs that we can use or probably, probably some combination uh, therapy that we can use to treat uh, CRE. So I think all of us are quite... Uh, preoccupied by COVID nowadays, uh, especially for the past one year. Uh, just last week, as I was preparing my slides on Saturday, um, globally, we have passed this uh, 2 million uh, death uh, of COVID death, uh, whole, whole, the whole world. Uh, so it's a very grim milestone for all of us. Uh, but my concern now is that, um, you know, as in the midst of us uh, trying to battle this COVID, we are actually forgetting that uh, there's another pandemic that's been going on around the world, uh, at least for the past 10, 10 years or so, that's causing uh, significant morbidity and mortality huh, for, uh, around the world. So that is uh, antibiotic resistance. Uh, it may not have caused uh, you know, 2 million uh, per year of death, uh, but uh, yes, estimated that uh, every year there's about 750,000 uh, deaths due to uh, antimicrobial resistance. So, and there's uh, economists that actually predicted 
that if we don't do anything about this antimicrobial resistance, um, if, if, if everything, you know, just status quo, we're not going to change our strategy, we're not going to change the way we manage patients, especially with antibiotics is concerned, uh, we're going to reach a, a green milestone as well. You know, by the year 2050, we will anticipate that we will have uh, at least 10 million deaths per year due to antimicrobial resistance. And these numbers are actually well surpassed other cause of death, particularly cancer death, as well as uh, other uh, uh, disease as well. Uh, and, and out of these 10 million deaths that is predicted in 2050, uh, the yearly death, a majority, almost half of them will be in Asia because of our populations and also our poor healthcare system in many of the countries. So that's why it's, it's, um, it's, it's good that you know, we have this session to revisit or to remind ourselves that there is, there is actually an ongoing pandemic of antimicrobial resistance around the world, uh, which is going to cause us even more problems, you know, especially deaths, mortality uh, to, to, uh, the, the, in terms of the global uh, uh, mortalities. So I think like most of, I'm not sure about you, but uh, for me, I think uh, the Avengers Endgame uh, my, was my last movie that I went and watched in the cinema. Okay? I, haven't, you know, I haven't been stepping into a cinema for a very long time, particularly in the, the whole year of 2020. Um, I was quite fascinated about this, uh, this term, end games. Okay? I'm not sure whether any one of you uh, know the true meaning of end games. It was particularly used, frequently used in, in, in chess. Okay? I myself am not a fan of chess. I, I'm not good at chess. But basically, end game, this, this term end games are actually used to describe a stage of chess where you, are, uh, you come to the, to the end, almost the end of your game, where you have left with uh, very few chess pieces. You don't have much many options left. And what you do for the next few steps that you take is going to determine the outcome, all right? If you make a wrong step, most likely you're going to lose the game. Uh, if you don't change your strategy, most likely you're going to lose the game in the end. So uh, wait, I'm not sure about you, but you really look at this report, like, you know, for instance, this uh, blood culture report of Enterobacter cloacae in the blood culture, where it's reported that all the, the, the antibiotics are resistant, okay? All the antibiotics are resistant, which is, as you can see, are for all the antibiotics except cholestin, all right, which is sensitive. So it does feel like we are in the end game for this patient because especially when the patient is critically ill in the ICU, you know, when the yeah, patient is still intubated, you know, struggling with uh, uh, infections, now suddenly you have a blood culture that grew CRE in this patient. And you know that the chance of this patient going to recover or, or survive from this sepsis uh, is going to be very, very uh, green, you know. Uh, because we all know that CRE mortality is at least 40 to 50 percent. Right? If you look through the literature, most of the reports will tell you that uh, CRE mortality will be at least 50 percent. Okay, so if you have a patient with a bacteremia due to CRE, the, the chance of survival, the chance of him recovering, you know, is as good as like putting a coin, you know. Um, and cholestin, as we know, is a lousy antibiotics. Um, if you don't know the, the antibiotics, you may think that the cholestin is a game changer drug, you may think that the cholestin is what we call the savior drug. Is actually it's not because cholestin is really a lousy drug because um, it is not because of this antibiotic resistance, we probably won't use it anyway because cholestin uh, is, is known to have a lot of toxicity, especially near toxicity. So based on my own experience, you know, whenever we give cholestin, we anticipate that at least half of the patient will develop uh, uh, some form of renal failures. So uh, also because of this uh, dosing as, as, especially, um, it's very difficult to achieve a therapeutic level Probably you need a one or two days to achieve a proper therapeutic level with cholestin to to uh, uh, co uh to counter to, to, to treat this uh, CRE or, or any of the uh, uh, resistant bacteria. So and I think until now there's still a lot of controversy regarding the dosing, you know, and it keep on changing uh, in, in the guidelines. So uh, overall, I think we are losing the battle against CRE. Okay, I guess that's why we're having this session again and again. Uh, this is just one of the example that I I mentioned just now regarding um, CRE mortality. Uh, if you have uh, bacteremia with CRE, okay, your chance of survival, your chance of uh, death mortality is about four, four times at least compared to those patients who have uh, a sensitive uh, uh, gram-negative bacteria in the blood. So uh, if you can remember, I mentioned about cholestin. It's not a game-changer drug. It's a lousy drug. And now we know that there's uh, this, what we call MCR1 genes among this uh, 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 gram-negative bacteria that can actually enable the, the bacteria to be resistant against a cholestin. So basically, if you have a, uh, a, a patient with the, the bacteria which is resistant even with cholestin, basically they are telling you that you have no, no uh, treatment modalities or treatment available to, to treat these uh, CRE in patients' infections. 
So let's let's go back to um, basics. Huh? What is Enterobacterium CA? All right. Uh, even though I'm an IV physician, I think sometimes I find it very difficult to spell the, the word Enterobacterium CA. I, I think I, it took me about one year to, to actually learn how to pronounce it correctly and another year to correctly you know, to spell it. But anyway, Enterobacterium CA is actually a large uh, gram-negative bacteria which encompasses uh, these few common uh, bacteria. Uh, there are many more, but these are the ones that uh, I, I would say they're clinically relevant and clinic commonly seen in our clinical practice. Uh, basically, entero means bowels or guts. So these are the bacteria that are commonly found in our guts, all right? in our bowels, in our, our gastric uh, environments. Um, and that, and uh, if you count by numbers, all right? if you count by numbers, in our bowels alone, there are 40 trillions of bacteria, uh, all these gram-negative bacteria. Uh, and we call, usually they are live harmonious harmoniously with us, they don't cause us much problem. In fact, they are important to us in the sense that uh, they help us to maintain this equilibrium if, of our bowel ecosystems. Um, and if you compare to our uh, numbers of uh, human cells, uh, particularly our red blood cells, uh, it's actually 30, only, only 30 trillions. So 40 trillions is much more than 30 trillions. So in, in a way, you know, we, are more back, we have more bacteria in us than, uh, than human cells. Huh? So we always call the bacteria colonizer. This, but if you think if you think deep about it, probably we are the colonizer. They are the, probably the host. Huh? So uh, I'm sure most of you will recognize uh, or know Machikia. Um, our prime minister like to talk the talk, talk about Machikia, you know, especially during his uh, speech in a uh, live na national TVs. So uh, today I'm gonna do the same. I'm gonna talk about a story about Machikia. All right. So Machikia, just like uh, any ordinary Malaysians, uh, she had a, unfortunately she had a stroke. All right, she was admitted to the hospital somehow. She survived. Luckily, she survived the stroke. And now she's um, probably having some hemiparesis, you know, some weakness because of the stroke and uh, requires some uh, rehabilitation care. And because uh, the family cannot take care of her at home, she was sent to a nursing home. So in the nursing home, uh, some of the other nursing home inmates are actually CRE carriers. That means they have, they have CRE with them. No? Uh, but... Uh, during the, the nursing care, during the nursing care in a nursing home, uh, the, one of the nurse did not practice a proper uh, hand hygiene. So basically, they, they contaminate the, the, her hand and subsequently transmit or, or spread the CRE to Machikia. All right. So now Machikia, being a CRE, Machikia will become a CRE carrier because uh, this CRE will keep on growing in his uh, in her uh, bowels, uh, especially when when he was she was frequently treated with antibiotics by the GP. Whenever she have a cough or common cold, you know, when you when the when the machikia was brought to the GP, she was prescribed with some antibiotics. So these antibiotics will actually uh, clear off all the sensitive uh, bacteria in her guts. So this allows the, the CRE to continue to grow and, and outnumbers the rest of the sensitive bacteria. So this is what we call the CRE colonization. All right. So first you got you got uh, you become a CRE carrier when you are contaminated by. Uh, someone who has you know, washed their hands will somehow spread the CRE to you. And uh, because of antibiotic pressure, this CRE will keep, continue to grow and subsequently you become a full blown uh, uh, CRE carrier. So one day, uh, this Machikia became ill and subsequently was transferred to an acute hospital for further treatment. And um, so the same cycle happens again because in the hospital, nobody uh, actually swap for her, do a, do a swap to look for CRE. Uh, nobody knows that she is a CRE carrier. So the doctors and the, and, the, and the healthcare workers in the hospital also did not practice uh, uh, contact precautions. They don't wash their hands. So they also, also spread the CRE to other uh, patients as well, especially in the same cubicle or the same ward. Right? And finally, Machikia unfortunately succumbed to the severe sepsis and her blood culture grew Capsular Pneumonia CRE, which is resistant to everything except cholestin. Okay? So based on the story of Machikia, you realize that most of the time, uh, CRE is actually start, they always, always start with colonization, okay? Uh, they always start with colonization, and because of the antibiotic uh, pressure, they will start to grow in the patients. Uh, put in the voices. So, so when they start growing, if you don't stop the antibiotics, eventually it becomes an infection, okay? So when you have a sterile, when you have a, a, a sterile sample culture that grew a CRE, most of the time, it will be just a colonization, all right? Uh, it's, just, it's just, just a signal that tells you that you know this patient is undergoing uh, antibiotic pressure and then this patient actually uh, uh, have a CRE in her. So if you continue to, to, to give antibiotic, prospective antibiotics, eventually this CRE will actually outgrow the rest of its uh, sensitive bacteria 
can cause infections, uh, especially when the patient is ill, immunocompromised, you know, uh, given steroids or, uh, or, or given the chemotherapy because of the uh, uh, underlying uh, malignancy. Uh, so eventually it will turn infection. And then you have all the clinical signs and symptoms of sepsis uh, in the patient. So this is the data from my own hospital uh, uh, provided by my infection control. So every year we are doing surveillance. Every month we are doing surveillance, looking at how many uh, CRE uh, case we have. You know? these, are, these numbers are uh, uh, represent, representing the cases of CRE in our hospital. So, we, so you can see the total number of cases actually it came down huh? from 2018. It went up a bit to 2019 and came up to 2020. I think this is because of the pandemic, the COVID pandemic that actually caused the, the uh, because of the reduced emissions, uh, of especially the general patients, especially less patients coming to the hospital. And then we are more, because of the, because of the COVID, we are more uh, 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 contact precaution, uh, cautious, you know, you wash your hands more often. So that's why the, the, the cases are coming down. And we even divide into our cases into infection and also colonizer. As you can see in this data, you find that only one third of the cases are actually infection that requires treatment for CRE, all right? All right? And another two thirds of the cases, they are actually, they are actually colonizer, basically because uh, you know, they did, did the CRE, they found the CRE in the urine culture, but the patient is actually very well, or they did a routine anal swap. So in our hospital, we, our ICU, we, have, we, we practice what we call entry swap for CRE, anal swap. So every, every, any patient that, uh, got admitted to the ICU, they will be, uh, they'll, 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 they'll do an anal swap to look for CRE. So I think majority of our, our colonizers is actually coming from the routine uh, 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 pre-emission pre swap in ICUs. Okay, so majority of these colonizer cases or CRE carriers does not require treatment at all. Okay, unless they eventually lead to infection, just like why the scenario that I mentioned just now. So the question now is when to treat CRE? Uh, so the, the simple answer is don't treat CRE, particularly colonizer. All right. Um, so the so so the the answer is actually not a simple yes or no. All right. But I would say don't treat CRE, but treat the infection. Okay. So if the infection is caused by CRE, then you start appropriate treatment for CRE. So there's a there's a different approach here. Okay. So we don't treat CRE just because it's CRE. We treat the CRE because patient have an infection that caused by CRE. All right. For instance, uh, you have tissue culture. All right, in the orthopedic ward, in the you have a tissue culture that grows CRE. So if the tissue is actually coming from a wound debridement, you know, in, in the OT setting, you know, coming from this kind of wound, this kind of wound with this kind of uh, erythema, you know, cellulitis, surrounding cellulitis, a possible underlying uh, small abscess over you know, near the, the wound, this this kind of wound actually is crying out for antibiotic, crying out for a treatment. So if the CRE is coming from this kind of wound. It probably will have will, will treat the, the CRE with cholestin or some other drugs. Huh? But if the tissue culture that grew CRE comes from this kind of wound, which is, looks very clean, all right, most likely we're gonna not gonna treat because most likely it's just gonna, not, just gonna be a colonizer. All right. Uh, the same same principle, you know, if you have a trigger aspirate that grew, grew CRE coming from this patient with this kind of X-ray and uh, with this kind of lungs, and patient is actually come comfortable under room air. Or, or the oxygenation is actually uh, reducing, you know, patient is only from the recording nasoprong, you know, from, from uh, intubation, extubated, and we've now only requiring nasoprong oxygen. Even though the trucker has break good CRE, you probably won't do anything on it, okay? In contrast, if the CRE is coming from a trucker has break from this kind of lung, you know, in the OT, uh, in the, an ICU setting, uh, intubated patient, if, where there's a consolidation all over the place, all over the lungs, you probably will start in fact, uh, a treatment for the CRE, okay? And of course, treating infection is not just about uh, antibiotics, it's also about source control, all right? Uh, with this kind of wound, you probably want to advise the orthopedic surgeons to go in and debride the wound because we know, uh, as I said, cholestin is not a, a good drug, especially in, when it comes to tissue penetration, it's very poor. Uh, so you can't rely on, on cholestin alone to treat this kind of uh, infected wound. You probably need some, sort, some form of source control, either by wound debridement, and in some worst case scenario, you might want to consider uh, amputations, all right? So, uh, and on the other hand, if the CRE is coming from a supposedly sterile sample, like your blood, like your CSF, like your pro fluid, or your deep tissue, you know, during the, the wound department, you probably would, would want to treat, you know, because uh, they are probably most likely going to be pathogens huh, in these sterile samples. So uh, I'm not sure whether it's Dr. Chris or, or Dr. Suresh that, that told me before that 
um, you know, Dr. Chris and Dr. Suresh always have a lot of words of wisdom. So I, I can always remember that. Uh, so I remember uh, I was told that um, uh, in order to find a good answer, you need to ask a good questions. All right. So a lot of times people, when they, when they want to consult me or refer me a case, they ask me about CRE. You know? They always ask me the simple question, you know, should I treat this CRE or not? So I think this, this is not a, not a uh, good question. You most likely not, you're not going to get a good answer. Uh, as, I, as I illustrated this down uh, from my previous slides. So I think that the, 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 the good question would be, are, you, are we worried if it's not CRE? So you're looking at this patient, you, you receive a report, uh, let's say a, a, a urine culture report that says patient have a CRE in urine. So are you worried because of the CRE or are you worried because of the condition of the patient? So if the patient, general condition is very well, like this patient here, waiting to be discharged soon, Okay, suddenly, you know, the, the urine culture report comes back three days ago, that was taken three days ago and, and, and reported as CRE, you know, resistant, resistant to everything except cholestin. Uh, most likely, we're not going to treat this patient, all right? Also, you want to look at the patient's other, uh, other parameters, uh, like your vital signs, your BP pulse rate, your temperature, uh, mental status, your inflammatory markers, you know, your white cell count, uh, your CRP, if you have, whether it's coming down trend or going up trend. Uh, or procalcitonin, which is a more specific inflammatory marker when it comes to sepsis and pneumonia. Uh, also, uh, organ, any organ failure that's, that's indicating that patient is having sepsis or any source of infection. Okay? So you have to look at patient holistically. Don't just look at the report. So very often, I ask the, the MO or the houseman to leave the report aside first. Let us assess the patient and determine whether the patient is having any, any form of infection or sepsis. If the patient is having any form of infection or sepsis, particularly when there's an obvious source, then we look at the report. You know? so, so if the infection is due to the CIE, as I mentioned just now, then we start treatment. So again, I think uh, the answer for, for this when it comes to when to treat the CIE is that we, we should not treat CIE treat, treat because it's a CIE, but we treat because there's an infection. Okay? So I think this is a very important concept. Uh, and it, it applies to all other uh, uh, bacteria as well. And uh, whether, it, whether it's an ESBL or MRSA, you know, we don't treat this because it's, it's a multi-resistant organism, but we treat because it's an infection. So then we then we decide what to what to treat, what 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 uh, antibiotic to start and treat the organisms. All right. So I hope that it really help us help us to clear our our, our mindset when we how we approach uh, uh, CRE when you know to decide whether to treat or not. So, so the next question is how to treat CRE. So in order to understand how to treat CRE, we have to understand what is carbapenemase, all right? So there are basically three types of, uh, three classes of carbapenemase based on the ambler classifications. Uh, the most common type will be the class A, uh, or rather uh, it's better known as KPC, okay? Capsular pneumonia uh, enterobacterial CA, all right? Uh, is, uh, found worldwide, especially in the US and also some of the European country as well. As you can see, the, the class A at carbapenemase or KPC uh, have a, a ability or this, this enzyme can actually hydrolyze almost all the antibiotics, penicillin available, uh, all the beta lactams available, your penicillins, your, all your cathrosporins, you know, even your astronams, your monobactams, as well as your carbapenems. But in certain, in certain strain of KPC, you'll find that they are sensitive to uh, 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 some uh, beta lactamase inhibitors, uh, such as your salvectum, your thiazobactam, or your clavulinic acids. Okay? Um, and then there's another a class of carbapenemase, which is a class B, or better known as uh, MDM1 or MDLs. Okay? This, this class of uh, uh, carbapenemase, again, they, are, they are, can hydrolyze all the beta lactams except astronems. All right? Actually, astronems is not exactly the beta lactams, they, they are called the uh, monobactam, another class of uh, uh, antibiotics. So, so every, they can hydrolyze all everything, beta lactams except astronems, and they are not sensitive at all to beta lactamase inhibitors. Okay, so there's a reason why I put a star there. Right? Later on, when, when I explain the the, 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 the drugs, the, the drugs available to treat CRE, you will understand better. Uh, and this class B, uh, carbapenemase, actually was commonly found in, in uh, Southeast Asia, huh? in our parts of the country. All right. So there's another one which is class D, uh, which is uh, not as common as class C and class A. So we won't go into it. Uh, so as I mentioned, NDM1 is a class B uh, carbapenemase, which was first found in 2009 uh, from a patient, a Swedish patient, a Swedish, Swedish national who came back from India, uh, New Delhi. That's why that's how they got the name from uh, New Delhi metallo beta lactamase. Uh, 
So of course, the, the people in India won't be happy because of the memes, uh, just like you know, COVID-19, you know, we should not call it a, a, a Chinese virus or, or, or a Wuhan virus, right? So, but I mean, anyway, this, this strain of, uh, 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 like, uh, strain of uh, uh, isolate was, which harbor uh, this NDM was called as NDM1 um, uh, cow penamase. Okay, so, so, so they, I'm sure some of you have heard about combination therapy because of the lack of uh, options of antibiotics to treat this uh, cow penamase producing uh, enterobacterial CA. There are a lot of talks about using combinations, all right? Because we don't have a, a good uh, drugs, a single drug to treat uh, uh, this uh, CRE. So we are using combinations. So there are a lot of uh, uh, studies, a lot of uh, clinical trials, uh, or even uh, uh, a pra uh, uh, clinical practice that are using combination therapy. Hopefully, ho hopefully they can find a, a perfect combinations to treat the CRE. Uh, but so this is this, this study from Tam Tamberalo. I think it's a Spanish uh, studies. Uh, they're looking at the KPC producing uh, CRE. Okay. So they look at the predictors for mortality in the red strip infection caused by CRE. And also in these studies, they also highlight the importance of uh, combination therapy. So um, in these studies, in this cohort, they found that uh, those patients who have higher risk of uh, mortalities are those patients with presented, presented with uh, septic shock, those who have uh, inadequate uh, initial antimicrobial treatment, uh, those who have high Apache score. Okay. So I, I, think, I think this is common sense, right? Those patients who are ill, who develop CRE, they're most likely going to die. Okay? But what is, what is interesting about this uh, study is that uh, they found, also found that those patients who are given combination therapy, particularly tegacycline, cholestine, and meropenem, they actually have a lower odds of uh, mortality. Okay? So I think because of this trial, because of these studies, uh, people are actually started looking at combination therapy for uh, CRE. But then again, you might ask us, you might ask me, you know, uh, CRE is resistant to carbenums. And then now we are using meropenum as a combination of, of uh, therapy to treat CRE. So it's kind of a counterintuitive. But if you look in, into the result of the studies, uh, the, the effect of this carbenum in the combination therapy is actually pretty much uh, rely on the MIC of the meropenum. Okay? So uh, this graph actually shows, us, this is a couple of my, uh, uh, graph on survival of the patients in, the, in this cohort. You can see combination therapy, they have a higher, higher rate of survival compared to those patients given monotherapy. But if you, if you do a sub-analysis on these patients on combination therapy, which is not many, there are only 36 cases of them, um, the, the survival percentage is actually highest when the meropenum MIC is uh, lower. Okay, MIC is a minimum inhibitory concentration. So basically it just, it, 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 in a simple way to describe it is that it's a, it's a, uh, the lower the MIC, that means the, 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 the more sensitive the bacteria is towards the particular uh, antibiotics. So if the, if the meropenem MIC is low, you can see that the survival rate is actually much higher. But as the MIC uh, increases, especially when it's more than 16, you'll find that the, the, the uh, uh, survival percentage, hold on, uh, I just try to... The survival percentage of the, uh, uh, the patients actually uh, reduces, okay? Especially when it's more than 16 and a more, more uh, MIC, okay? So, so basically the positive carbonyl effect is clearly seen when the MIC is less than eight, but beyond that, I think the effect is actually, you will start to lose that, that uh, uh, positive effects huh, of the combination therapy if you're using the meropenem with a high MIC. So this is another, uh, uh, a review on 20 clinical trials. Uh, so they include at least about 900 patients. So they're also looking at the compare on, on patients with CRE that was given uh, inappropriate therapy compared to those patients who are given monotherapy. Obviously those who are given inappropriate therapy will have a higher uh, mortality rate compared to those given uh, monotherapy. But if you look into, if you look into the uh, statistical significance, it's actually not significant huh, between these two groups. Uh, and if you compare those patients given monotherapy, okay, regimen B is the one with given monotherapy compared to a regimen C, which is combination therapy, you can see the mortality rate is actually significantly reduces, reduced uh, from 38% to 27%. Okay? Combination therapy means that they use at least two or more uh, drugs which is active in vitro. That means it's, it's, it's from, it based on the, the culture report, the, culture, the sensitivity report that says that these patients uh, uh, isolate uh, these isolates are actually MIC is low sensitive. Okay? 
Okay, so they use that combination to treat the patient and they find that there's a significant difference between the two, uh, between monotherapy therapy and combination therapy. And if you look in the sub-analysis between the combination therapy, um, uh, this combination therapy that, that does not include calpenum, okay, uh, which is regimen C1. And those patients with combination therapy, which include uh, melpenum or calpenums uh, in, in the regimen C2, you, can, you find that the combination, combination therapy that include a calpenum uh, actually have a much lower uh, uh, mortality outcome, right? From 30 compared to 18%, okay? So, so it, it, it means that when you talk about combination therapy in CRE, uh, the first principle is if you include calpenum, it's better, okay? The second uh, principle is if the calpenum MIC is lower, then the outcome will be even better, all right? So, so uh, and in this trial, if you, if you in, this, in this study, when you look at, in this meta-analysis, you look at their, all the trial, uh, clinical trials that included, all the MIC breakpoints that, that they use for calpenum is actually very low, uh, less than four or four or less, you know? Even some trials, uh, some trials are actually using uh, uh, less than one. So pretty much, so but what basically what I'm trying to say is that the, 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 in all the studies that they use calpenum as combination therapy, all the MIC uh, of the isolates are actually very low, uh, at least eight or below. So this is a, a summary of all the, the summary of the uh, uh, of the guidelines for, for CRE, uh, how, how to approach. So you find, find that for breast tube infection, usually we, rec we recommend high dose uh, meropenum on top of boronixin B. Okay. So if especially when the, the meropenum MIC is less than 16, 16 or less, so you should actually consider using calpenum as a combination therapy together with polymixin B. Okay. But if your polymixin B or your cholestin uh, MIC is very high, for instance, you know, uh, uh, MIC is more than two, you probably will not use cholestin, probably you use other available drugs which is more sensitive. Okay. So and the calpenum that we, we are talking about is we are using high dose, uh, at least two grams, eight hourly, uh, three times a day. And we are using prolonged infusions huh, to, to overcome this PKPD. Okay, so uh, the same applies to the, uh, the lung infection, pneumonia, uh, GI infection, especially as well as uh, urine. Huh? So, so urine tract infections in the CRE. Sometimes, if your center you have phosphomycin, you can actually use phosphomycin because phosphomycin is uh, actually a, a rather new drug. Uh, sometimes the CRE can still be uh, uh, sensitive to phosphomycin. So you can actually use phosphomycin and it comes usually in the oral form, you know, oral sachet, where you give three grams, one sachet a day uh, for you know, every three days uh, for three, three times. Uh, so, all right. Okay. So, but going back to what I've said just now, um, all, the, all the studies, all the trials that they, they look at is actually looking at KPC, all right? The class A, uh, uh, CRE, class A carbonamase. But uh, if you remember what I said that in our, our regions, uh, Southeast Asia, most of our uh, CRE isolates are actually class B, uh, which is our NDM, uh, metal, metal low, uh, beta, uh, beta lipase. So, so all our CRE predominantly are ND, NDM1, okay? Uh, KPC is actually, we rarely see KPC in our, in our uh, countries especially. So what does it mean is that uh, our NDM1 usually have a very high MIC, okay? This is, another, this is a paper that shows you shows you that NDM1, the uh, MIC for meropenum or MI in penum is actually very high. Usually it's 32 and above, okay? We hardly see uh, MIC uh, of meropenum in our, in our CRE isolates where it's uh, 16 or even less, okay? So now it comes to questions, you know? Uh, studies on combination therapy were mostly done on KPC isolates and whether all these results, uh, which is uh, promising result, you know, to show the better outcome, whether it really applies to our population here when they have a CRE, especially when they have this NDM1 isolates uh, in the infections. So combination therapy may not work huh, for NDM1 due to the high calpenum MIC. And if you keep on using meropenum as a combination therapy, whether we will have, we will have caused more collateral damage, especially in terms of selecting out even more uh, uh, resistant organism, huh? even like, even like the, you know that you, you keep on giving meropenum, you probably will select uh, more candida, you know, for instance, you, know, you probably predispose patient into uh, uh, invasive uh, uh, fungal infections. So, so now the question is, is there any new drugs for CIE right at the moment, all right? So the question is, yes, there are a few new drugs available. Uh, and most of, the, most of the new drugs are actually mix and match. For instance, you know, there are uh, this drug called Cef Ceftazidine plus uh, avidectin, which is the beta-lactamase inhibitors. 
and meropenum and, and favobactam. Okay, so these are the combination drug in, in uh, uh, it's combination of uh, uh, caprosporin together with uh, beta lactamase inhibitors. Again, you look at the in vitro activities. Most of most of the, the reports will tell you that these drugs are, uh, are active against KPC. Okay, no mention about MDN at all. Okay. So there are three things that are certain in life: um, death, taxes, and also beta lactamase resistance. Okay, if you look through the history, when we start off with penicillin, everybody was, uh, you know, uh, thinking that penicillin will solve our infection problems. Huh? But uh, after a few years, we realized that you know, the, the bacteria managed to produce a beta lactamase. That's why we need to add on the beta lactamase inhibitors or, or, or create a new group called caprosporins to overcome this uh, beta lactamase. And even then, after a while, you know, the, the bacteria getting getting more and more, uh, getting smarter and smarter, we even produce uh, MC. Uh, ESBL or MC to overcome our uh, caprosporins. And now, of course, uh, we are talking about calpinamase. Uh, the bacteria were able to produce calpinamase that overcome our calpinam. So if, so if you keep on doing the same thing and again and again, as uh, Albert Einstein was saying, you know, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result, we probably will not go anywhere. You know, we keep on using uh, beta lactams, keep on combining uh, beta lactamase inhibitors, hoping that we overcome the, the enzyme before. Before long, you know, the bacteria will actually learn and create a new type of enzyme that can hydrolyze the new drugs that we created. So I think it's about time that we should start to think outside the box. We should not keep on looking at beta lactams. We should think about a novel drugs which has nothing got to do with beta lactams at all, so that we can have a more uh, 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 can can preserve the effect of the antibiotics longer uh, compared to uh, beta lactams. So there are other drugs which is not non beta lactams that can be used. Uh, potentially used for, for CRE. Um, these are the two drugs here, iravalacycline, ira, ira which is a novel synthetic tetracycline, and also plasomycin, also a next generation aminoglycosides. And because it's a new drug and it's not a, it's a non beta lactams, most likely this drug will be sensitive uh, against CRE for, for a longer time, for a longer period of time. All right? But again, if you look into in vitro activities, you know, uh, no mention about NDM. Okay? KPC, yes. So there's another two drugs I want to particularly mention here, astronem uh, combination with avibactam, uh, which is a monobactam plus uh, beta lactamase inhibitors, which is avibactam, as well as a cephedrocal. All right. So astronem, as I mentioned just now, if you remember my previous slides, uh, for group B, class B uh, uh, carbapenemase, uh, they have this astronem is actually quite stable uh, against this uh, class B uh, class B carbapenemase. So if you if you use astronem, we can actually potentially treat the, the CRE, which is class B, which is NDM1 in our, in our region. Uh, but the problem is uh, with CRE is that it, they, they, they don't just produce uh, carbapenemase. At the same time, they also have other recent uh, genes that can produce uh, resistant uh, uh, enzymes, huh? uh, such as your ESBL, your MC, your OXA, uh, beta lactamase. You know? So this, this uh, beta lactamase, this ESBL, MC, and OXA, uh, can potentially uh, hydrolyze our astronems. So if you use astronem alone, you probably won't get to, won't, won't have any activity against the, the CRE isolate, which is class B, which contain other types of beta lactamase. So you need something to protect these astronems. So that's why this avidectum, which is a novel uh, beta lactamase inhibitors comes in. You know? It sort of protects you, protects astronem against all these uh, uh, beta lactamase. Okay? So this avidectum, when you combine with astronems, so you, do, you allow this astronem to do its work against this uh, uh, CRE. Another drug is cephalodraco, uh, which I think uh, it really shows that you know people are start thinking outside the box. You know? uh, for a bacteria, for uh, antibiotics to enter a bacteria, usually they will go through these uh, pouring channels, right? These pouring channels. Um, so. When they go in the one of this pouring channel, there are a few mechanisms that the bacteria can actually uh, uh, inactivate or hydrolyze these uh, antibiotics. One way is that they can have some, uh, some uh, efflux pumps to pump out these uh, like antibiotics. Even though the uh, antibiotics manage to go, go through this, uh, uh, this channel, there are beta lactamase waiting there to hydrolyze the antibiotics. So, so we need to find a way to bypass this channel. So that's why scientists begin to think outside the box. And then they realize that you know in a, in a bacterial uh, in a in a bacterial membrane there's also another channel called the ion transport channel 
where the bacteria uses the channel to transport all the iron into the cell. Just because bacteria needs iron to survive, they need to, iron to produce energy. That's why they have this specific channel for the iron. For the for iron to, to be transported through the channel into the cells, they need this uh, cedrophore uh, compound. Okay? So, the, so what the scientists did is that they used this cedrophore compound to combine with uh, antibiotics, a caprosporin. They, they, they hide, basically, they hide the caprosporin inside this cedrophore compound to trick the bacteria to allow this, this antibiotic cedrophore to enter the cells uh, without much resistance. And once enter the cells, these antibiotics will bind to the penicillin binding proteins and, 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 uh, and, in, and, and act on the, on the cell wall synthesis, okay? just like any other uh, antibiotics. So this, is, this strategy is actually quite uh, remarkable and it's very interesting. It just shows that scientists are thinking outside the box. So we need to actually, when we approach a novel drugs, we should, should approach in such a way that we don't rely too much on data like the usual mechanisms. You know, we should get out of the way of the conventional way of administrating or, or, or treating the, the, the bacteria. So this strategy is something like a Trojan horse. Huh? If you know about the Greek history, how the Greek soldiers hide inside the Trojan horse, and then the, the Trojan city, you know, thought that this is a gift from the Greek. They allow the Trojan horse to enter their, their cities. And in the middle of the night, the, the, the Greek soldiers actually come out from the Trojan horse and, and open the door for other Greek soldiers to enter the cities. Huh? So, so it's, a, it's a very fascinating day, looking at how these new drugs come about. Uh, I won't go, through, go into details on this. Uh, just to show you that this cephedrocal um, actually has been extensively studied in, in clinical trials compared with other uh, uh, common uh, antibiotics that we are using, including imipenem, nalpenem, and other best antibiotics available. Um, this is another, uh, uh, this, this is one of the, the trials that shows still that uh, cephedrocal is actually have a higher, better outcome compared to the usual imipenem against uh, uh, complicated, uncomplicated pinonephritis uh, or UTIs. So it looks promising, but if you look into, uh, if you look into all the, the drugs available and look into our, our uh, CRE that is, that is commonly seen in our countries, especially in our region, as I mentioned, our region, most of our CREs are NDM1, okay? In overseas, in US, in other parts of the country, most of them are KPC. KPC, it looks promising because most of the new drugs is actually quite active against it, okay? They have a quite, uh, uh, effective drugs uh, against the KPC isolate. But for NDM, it's quite limited. What we left is actually cephedrocal, which is not available. I don't know how, when is it going to be available in our country. Uh, also, uh, eravacycline, as well as astronem and um, The rest is actually not active at all. Okay, As I mentioned, NDM1, basically, the, in terms of new drugs, is actually quite limited. So, Looking at, looking at this situation, we are actually at a clear disadvantage uh, in the CIA endgame, especially when all the drug companies are actually based in US, in, uh, in a Western country. They probably will focus more on KPC rather than NDM1 uh, in our country, in our regions. So now we, now we I've, I've finished talking about the treatment modalities, which is not very promising uh, as far as uh, NDM1 is concerned. So we are now we have to go back to the basics. You know? So we, we know that Treatment is limited, so we should start thinking about how to reduce the, the CRE uh, infections, especially CRE infection in our own centers. Okay, majority of uh, our CRE cases, as I mentioned in my data just now, um, are colonized, colonized patients, or rather they are core carriers, CRE carriers. Only a one third of them is actually uh, CRE infected patients. So this patient, we we can treat, we we can try to treat uh, in our wards, but there are a lot of more patients who are uh, carriers, you know, we, most of them are unknown or undiagnosed, okay? So these are, the, these are the group of patients that we need to be worried about because they potentially will cause CIE outbreak in our center, uh, especially in an acute hospital, in a big hospital like uh, our general hospital, in an acute ward, the patient comes in and out, we don't know who, who are CIE carriers. So I think we have to fall back into infection control, you know, to reduce the CIE rate in our center so that we don't have to rely too much on the treatment uh, for CIE, which is quite limited. All right, so go back to the basics, which is contact precaution, contact screening, as I mentioned just now, for, um, uh, the example of what my ICU, because we have a bad outbreak previously, you know, some years ago, that's why our ICU have practiced uh, pre-entry, pre-emission screening for all the patients entering ICU, you know, or even sometimes you, your patient transfer from other hospital, you know that hospital have a high CIA rate, you probably want to screen them before you, you after they admit to your site, so that once you know these patients are CRE carrier, you probably want to apply 
contact precaution. You know, tell, uh, uh, make sure there's a good spacing, make sure all the healthcare workers wash their hands, uh, wear the CIE apron, wear the gloves, and make sure you don't transmit the, the CIE from one patient to another. And of course, number three is very important, antimicrobial stewardship. So uh, you have to start cutting down our antibiotic usage, especially cross spectrum antibiotics, because the more we use, the more carbapenem we use, the more cross spectrum antibiotic you use, the CIE will definitely go up you know, because of this uh, selection, selective pressure that encourage the colonization of CIE in the patient. So everything is too tall if we don't wash our hands. So that's the basics, right? So the future is in our hands. So when you talk about CIE, we can never uh, leave without talking about infection control. You cannot, talk, cannot leave without talking about washing your hands, and hand hygiene, okay? And also antibiotic stewardship. Um, I don't want to talk too much about this because I don't have time, but I just want to leave you these two pictures. It does look silly when you try to hammer an egg, an egg huh, with a hammer, right? If you try to break an egg with a hammer, it looks very silly, right? So this is how silly we look like you know, whenever you, you use a carpenum, meropenum to treat a sensitive capsula or sensitive uh, uh, E. coli. You know? uh, so, so if you continue the carpenum, even though the, the report has tell you that this E. coli isolate is sensitive to, for instance, captriazone or unicin, you don't want to de-escalate, you, you believe in meropenum. This is how silly we, we look like. You, know? you, will do, you will do the job, but most likely you're going to cause a mess. So in, in an in a, in, in a antibiotic sense, you know, you, you, and Meropen definitely will work against the sensitive E. coli, but eventually you lead to CRE in the patient later on. So always remember, you have to use the right tool for the right job, okay? Uh, so I'm just going to leave you with this quote. Uh, if you don't get smart with antibiotics, the bacteria will. Uh, so this is especially true when it comes to uh, CRE. So choose your next move wisely. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Thank you very much. Uh, I think you covered CRE very well in a sh short span of time. And in, I, I know it was challenging, uh, but I think you put the right focus at the right times. Well, let me summarize very briefly. Basically, Stephen just spent uh, 30 odd minutes uh, to tell us a lot of bad news, all right? <laughs> Pretty bad news. Basically, we don't have really many good drugs. Yes, there are some promising drugs, but I used the word promising really because in terms of NDM1 which is what we are dealing with in this part of the world in particular Malaysia uh, even the new drugs coming on may not be a game changer uh, so we have to make do with what we have now most of the questions that come in some are related of course the main one aspect of infection control and, and also stewardship but there are some questions in relation to the way we treat uh, 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 CRE so I, I just let me get the ball rolling Stephen now, in a typical patient with a CRE confirmed infection, not a colonizer, confirmed infection, yeah. sometimes uh, uh, our, our data is not completely there, all right? Let's say you are treating somebody empirically without the other details coming from the lab. What regimen would you use now on the average CRE case that you have? Um, so... Um... So while waiting for you mean while waiting for susceptibility uh, correct, testing? correct, correct. Yeah, yeah. So it, it so so in my practice, uh, if the patient is having CIE bacteremia, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, we usually will give cholestin as a first line or polymixin B, whichever is available. Uh, of course, there are some some people that say the polymixin B is better than cholestin, but uh, I would say just what use whatever you have, right? Um, uh, whether to combine with meropenem or not, I think if the patient is critically ill and is bacteremia, I, I, was, I usually will empirically uh, combine with meropenem for long infusions, uh, 2 gram TDS uh, for, for non-renal uh, failure patients. Um, then uh, once the, the susceptibility testing comes out, uh, we'll look at the MIC and see. Uh, if, if the MIC is very high, for instance, more than 32, um, which is usually the case, I'll probably will just stop the meropenem shop because we know that it won't work much. And in fact, it will just cause more collateral damage. Um, we'll just continue the cholestin or the polymixin B and hope for the best. And of course, we look for source control as well. Yes, Sato?
Hello. Since like Datuk punya Can you hear me? Hi. Oh, yeah, Steven. Okay, sorry. Can you hear me, Steven? Yeah, sorry. I can hear you now. Did you get my answer? <laughs> Hello, Dr. Chris? Oh, yeah, this, I had your answer. Let me read through some of the questions. I'll try to answer as many as we can. All right. Sure, so, okay. Sure, uh, sure, now, sure. this is from anonymous attendee. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, any inappropriate use of antibiotics will lead to CRE colonization. Are there? Tato, I miss you. I, I, I'm... Steven, can you hear me? Yeah, now I can. I can hear you now. Dr. Chris, I can hear you now. Steven? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yes. Okay. All right. Did you get the question? Uh, not, not, oh, not Stephen, entirely. Okay. Because yeah. of the connection, because the connection is bad. Can you see the questions in the submitted by the audience? Uh, yes, under I Q can. Under Q&A or under chat? Or oh, maybe save time. We just read from there. I apologize. Uh, All right. uh, I can't read because I, it gets interrupted. Right, right. Hold Carry on, on with that. Sure. Um, uh, under chat, maybe, or under Q&A, both. Any of you know, appropriate use of antibiotics will lead to CIA colonization or more specifically to carpenum and vertigo use. Uh, so I think the, the, the answer will be the broader the antibiotics, the higher the, the chance of CRE uh, selections and colonization. Of course, if you use carpenum, you you actually encourage the, the, the growth, uh, outgrowth of CRE in the patient. So, so the, the general idea is that we use broad spectrum. Uh, it's basically antibiotic stewardship principle. Uh, try to use as narrow as possible when it comes to antibiotics. If it can de-escalate, de-escalate, okay? Uh, just to add a point, Stephen, you're right. I think the important mm. thing on the day-to-day -day basis, the mm. more carbon, in, at least in Malaysia, that has been well shown, the more mm. carbon penem we use in a particular hospital, the mm. higher risk of yeah. CR rates. Of course, yeah. the other component is infection controller, you know? Yeah. But, Barring that, I think if we can focus on cutting back uh, carbapenem use, it, that would help. Yeah. 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 Hey, Stephen, carry on. Uh, would it be reasonable to expect a clinically ill patients if blood cultures are positive for bacteremia, for example? Hence, bacteremia always warrants treatment. Uh, yes, as I as I mentioned, if the CRE is in the sterile sample, supposedly said sterile sample, uh, most of the time we will treat, right? If it's bacteremia, okay. yeah. Okay, uh, Stephen, I, I, I feel bad. I read for you when I can read, okay? Uh, <laughs> That's all right. So, That's all. Dr. Stephen, can you share with us how, uh, how to treat CRE in your center? I think you mentioned that already with the yeah. limited new drugs available in Malaysia. I think you may have answered that, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Shall uh, we move on to yeah. the next question then? All right? Sure, sure. Uh, maybe maybe okay. i just add on to that. Uh, just like I mentioned about polystin and combination with malpenum, if the MIC is low, uh, I think for UTI, for instance, if the patient is not ill, for UTI, sometimes you can ask your lab to do a phosphomycin sensitivity. If it's sensitive, we probably can try a phosphomycin as well. Yeah. 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 Phosphomycin, I. I believe it's not. Tato, you're breaking up. Tato, you're breaking up. Can't, can't really hear you. I lost track. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Shall I, shall I read the questions? Um, Steven? Yeah. Steven, can you hear me? I, I, can hear, I can hear you now, boss. Yeah. I can hear you now. So maybe I shall. Uh, populations. 
uh, yeah, Dato, um, I, can you see the question? Yeah, which question are you looking at? Under uh, chat and from, from Werner. Under mm. chat. Yeah, which, which question is that? Uh, second question from Werner. Werner. The second question under chat, under not chat. under Q&A. All oh, right, Werner. Uh, I apologize to all the audience uh, because my, I think my connection is not good. So uh, yeah. So in a newly diagnosed CRE patient, should we send a rectal swab to confirm carriage? Um, yeah, so, so basically what it means is that uh, if the patient is diagnosed of CRE infections in, in the blood, for instance, do we do a, a anal swap? Um, so I think in, in my center, we, we do we do a swap, anal swap, just to, to, to prove that, uh, not just to see that you no know, patient is actually a CRE carrier or not. But most of most, the most time, when, whenever patient grows CRE in any of the sample, we usually will tag patient as a CRE carrier. Uh, so whether you can you want to do, do a, a anal swap or not, depends on your, your lab on your, your center, right? So I think, I think the basic principle is that once a patient has CRE, you're supposed to tag them as a CRE. Uh, you, have, you, have, you should have a system where you can, you will know that when patients get readmitted again, you know, you know that this patient has a CRE before and he has a CRE carrier. And so, so you should initiate, uh, institute this uh, contact precaution right from the beginning. You know, put him in the right uh, uh, appropriate cubicles, the appropriate uh, contact precaution measures, and every healthcare worker that approach the patients should be on uh, uh, contact precautions, you know, uh, hand hygiene, gloves, and also CI aprons, and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Okay, Stephen. Yeah. Uh, can you carry on? Just yeah. uh, let's try another five minutes. Let's see how many questions you can answer. Yeah. Uh, just, I apologize. Just read your questions from there if you don't mind. You pick. All right. Um, yeah. Okay. I'll just read on questions. Right, so call from QE. We are still practicing entry and exit swaps in my hospital due to recent outbreak and quite a few asymptomatic CRE colonizers and or carriers identified during the process and it's, it is still ongoing. So we have been practicing isolation and hygiene, but really what is the end game for this patient? <laughs> um, that's a good question. Uh, so of course, it's like casting a net. Um, of course, we want to cast a wide net. Uh, if the, the, the wider the net, we will probably will catch a lot of uh, CRE carriers you know, among the patients that's admitting to our centers. But uh, you, also come, you, you, also, you also have to ask the question whether your lab can cope or not with the, with the uh, sample that you are sending. You know? uh, if you're talking about all the entry cases to a general ward, for instance, you know, one day you probably need to send probably up to hundreds of, of you know, swaps you know, for, your, for your lab to, 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 to process. So I think we should be focused as well. So, so I think in the outbreak setting where you have a spike of CIE cases um, uh, in, your, in your center, I think it's, it's good you do an entry uh, screening, whether it's in a ward, or it is an ICU in a particular ward with a high incidence of CIE, then you can do entry screening, especially when you have a, a movement between a patient, movement of patient between wards or between hospitals. So I think in this kind of setting, you should the more you screen, the better, huh? especially when you have high, uh, uh, Incidents of, of CREs. Uh, but if your CRE rate is actually low, I think uh, probably you don't have to cast a, such a wide net. You probably just go by, uh, just go by uh, the patient history. You know, it's patient coming from an institutionalized center, from an old folks home, or from other hospital, which is a high, high rate of CRE. Then these are patients that you probably want to focus and screen instead of screening everyone that comes in your doorsteps. Uh, so it really depends on how much you can do and how much. Uh, in terms of cost effectiveness, you know, uh, uh, to bring down the CIE rate. That's why it's important you have to work with your infection control unit to monitor your CIE rate. Uh, just like our my, my data that I show you just now, just look at on a, on a weekly basis or a monthly basis, CAC, how's your CIE rate? If your CIE rate is going up, your infection control unit is supposed to alert you. Uh, for instance, you know, suddenly uh, uh, they're, they're telling you that, you know, uh, in your ICU for during the last month, there's a spike of CIE cases. So in that kind of setting, you probably want to do more screening, especially entry screening, even exit screening. Before you transport the patient, you probably want to screen before the patient goes to the general ward. Okay. Um, shall I go on? Um, sure. 
Oh, yes, um, can still go on. Yeah. Can I inquire as to CIE carriers, how should we proceed with their management and precaution for future admissions and care? Right. So if the patient is in the ward, if you know that this patient is CIE carrier, as I mentioned, it's good contact precaution. I think all, all infection control unit are uh, supposed to know how to do it. Um, and for future admissions, I think you have to create a system. If your, if your hospital is uh, computerized, uh, you can actually uh, ask your IT you know, to help you to, to, to tag the patient in the patient's uh, profile or patient's clinical notes. So whenever you look into the patient's notes in your computer, you, you, you're supposed to have a highlight that the patient is a CRE carrier, uh, just like allergic, allergy history. You know? so, so if you know that this patient is a, is a CRE carrier, then you know what to do when the patient is admitted to, the, to your hospitals. Okay, so that's all in the chat section. Should I go to the Q&A section? Um, how long we need to isolate or cohort a patient with CRE colonizer when admitted to hospital? So basically, I think the, answer, the question was asking about how long should we tag a CRE patient, a CRE carrier? Um, actually, there's no perfect answer on this because different centers will have different guidelines. But I think generally people will tag at least one year, but we know that uh, uh, CRE carrier can actually con continue to be CRE carrier up even more than one year. Huh? Um, but I think generally the principle is one year. After one year, uh, once a patient comes in, it would be good if you can repeat the swap, huh? repeat the annual swap. If it's already negative, at least two or three sample negative, then you probably can off tag the patient after one year. Uh, I think Australians are practicing one, one year tagging for CRE cases. They will, they will swap patient after one year. If it's submitted at least two or three samples uh, in a few weeks apart, if it's negative, they'll off tag the patients. Okay. Uh, right. So. Hi, Dr. Stephen. I think uh, we're four plus 10 yeah. now. Yeah. I think we uh, can end our session. Is it okay? Sure, sure. If it's, it's okay with Dato, yeah. Dato is the boss. Dato, I think, I'm not sure, Dato. Dato, I think he left and not sure. Yeah. That, that's fine with me. That problem. That's yeah. fine with me. That's fine with me. Okay. I think, yeah. uh, thanks, uh, Dato, Chris, and Dr. Stephen for a fruitful uh, session for today. And uh, there'll be a QR code for scanning in front of your screen. And uh, next week will be the last week of ID month. We will be, um, what do you call it? interesting topic and important is management of COVID-19. So see you guys next week. And I think it's next week is uh, on Wednesday, not Thursday, just for next week, Wednesday, 3 to 4 p.m. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Jivan. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Afik. Thank you, Dr.